Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowy, back here once again with more Ottoman history. Battle of the U1538. Actually, the next video was supposed to be a, from 1402 or like backtracking. I mean, this one's backtracking a little bit, but like a different uh, view of the of a battle I've already done. And so I skipped that one. Uh, you know, a couple of you guys actually recommended that in the comments. I appreciate that. And uh, this is kind of backtracking. I'm guessing like the, the Portuguese war for India, like I think there's like this and like this one and two more parts. And I think that's it for uh, the series, uh, at least for now anyways. Uh, but uh, uh, cause I'm not sure. I think they're still doing more videos, I believe even after the series, which I'll do give some catch up after that. But, uh, uh, yes, I guess this is like, a di and, um, still the Ottomans, but I guess a different area. I mean, we're in India. I mean, we've, we've kind of been concentrating a lot on like on Europe, you know, the Ottomans against Europe. I guess this is a different part. I'm sure they'll explain everything, but I just kind of backtracked a few years. And but I'm sure they'll explain everything and all that good stuff. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe button below. I'd really appreciate it. And let's jump into it. Bam. It is often said that nothing is new under the sun. Great powers always fought in colonial wars, both by using their proxies and directly. While the Ottoman Empire was on the rise in the early 16th century and fighting wars on numerous fronts, it was challenged by the burgeoning Portuguese Empire in the Indian Ocean. Today's video will explore the origins of the conflict between the two empires and cover the Battle of Diu in 1538, as Portugal and the Ottomans fight for dominance over India. In our opinion, learning new stuff and developing yourself is an essential part of being right India like. So it was like a more like a naval battle, like I'm guessing then uh, in the, uh, the obviously the Indian Ocean. Okay, so this is like definitely uh, some different stuff. It's not doesn't tie in with uh, the front, the European front. So this will definitely be interesting. And I guess another like breath of fresh air because we're kind of getting moved somewhere else. But anyways, thanks. Being human in our fast paced world, it's often difficult to find enough time, though, had been growing circumnavigation of Africa in 1498 access for one week to try it out. You'll also get 25% off if you want the full membership. Since Vasco da Gama first reached India after a circumnavigation of Africa in 1498, the reach and power of the Portuguese had been growing rapidly in the Indian Ocean. In 1500, the same Portuguese armada that had made first landfall in Brazil continued on to India bombarding Calicut and establishing Portugal's first Asian factory in Cochin. By 1504, Portuguese ships were regularly plundering Arab shipping in the Indian Ocean, with a blockade of the Red Sea earning them the ire of the Mamluk Sultanate and of their trading partner Venice. Uh, just like obviously we did why, uh, port, why Ottomans didn't uh, go to the Americas, and this was kind of like, a little bit of this was kind of pointed out in that video, how the you know there was a you know big deal between like it's like the Portuguese and uh because obviously everyone wants to, everyone wants to trade with India and other places over here for spices and whatnot and this was definitely one of those kind of issues and yeah Ottomans kind of control this area right anyways Red Sea earning them the ire of the Mamluk Sultanate and of their trading partner Venice. But despite Venetian encouragement and Ottoman material support for a coalition of Muslim powers against Portugal, little effective resistance was forthcoming in the early years of this Portuguese piracy. Hmm. The political fragmentation of Western India allowed the Portuguese to find ready allies despite their hostile bearing and the enmity of so many sultanates and city-states. And Mamluk Egypt, ruled as it was by an elite slave-soldier class, had long neglected naval concerns in favour of their famed cavalry armies. After a decisive Portuguese victory at the Battle of Diu in 1509 against Calicut, the Mamluks and the Sultanate of Gujarat, Portugal's dominance in the Indian Ocean would be unchallenged for nearly three decades. 
Central to these early Portuguese campaigns was Alfonso. My eyes were like up here. I'm like, how does this whole thing just end up slowly just taking over? And like, damn, they got a giant empire of their own up here. Hmm. So Dalbuquerque, a masterful admiral and statesman, acting with considerable autonomy in waters far distant from his homeland. He had already seized Muscat and Hormuz before the Muslim stand at Diu, and was elevated to become governor of Portuguese India in the same year, with the conquest of Goa following soon after. Despite a failure to capture Aden, by his death in 1515, Alfonso had established an effective network of ports and bases that would allow the Portuguese to fight on even terms a world away from their home shores. For the Mamluks, on the other hand, the loss of Indian trade was devastating. The flourishing trade port of Alexandria fell into stagnation and decline, with spices instead flowing into Lisbon. In an attempt to make up the loss, the Mamluks turned to oppressive taxation, causing instability and discontent. This proved to be one of the greatest factors in allowing the Ottoman Sultan Selim to rapidly defeat what had once been a major rival with the local nobility of Syria defecting en masse to Selim when he invaded in 1516. By the beginning of February 1517, Ottoman armies had entered Cairo and subjugated the nation. In doing so, Selim indirectly landed his first blow against the Portuguese, as their initial aim had been to capture Egypt and take control of the established trade routes, rather than diverting them through a long chain of expensive and vulnerable bases. But Egypt's change in rulers did not change the realities faced by Arab merchants in the Indian Ocean, and the Ottomans quickly found that they had inherited their predecessor's piracy crisis. Although no outright hostilities would occur between the Ottomans and the Portuguese during the reign of Selim, there was no doubt that war was inevitable, and each empire sought to gain allies and influence among the local rulers of India and East Africa in order to strengthen their position. Of chief importance were the ports of Aden, Hormuz, Basra and Diu, most of which would change hands more than once over the decades to follow. In their search for allies against the Portuguese, the Ottomans found common cause with the Somali Sultanates of Adel and Ajuran, and with the Sultanate of Gujarat in northwestern India. Gujarat had formerly been a dominant regional power before the Mughal Empire's incursions by land and Portuguese power at sea left it weakened and diminished, forced into tributary status to stronger empires to retain its autonomy. After being on the losing side of the Battle of Diu, a humiliating defeat in the heart of its territory, Gujarat would turn to the Ottomans for aid in maintaining control of its crucial trade ports. With the Balkan and Persian Wars still looming... Yeah, I mean... I mean Obviously, I, I think, I guess, the uh, areas around there, like India and all that stuff, I guess they had a lot to gain here, you know, like, who's got the best offer, you know, like the Portuguese or the, the Ottomans, like, hey, you, whoever give us, gives us the best offer, we'll side with you guys. So I'm sure uh, they were, I don't know if they would be loving this, like, kind of battle. I mean, I guess they probably aren't loving this, but they're definitely getting more than what they would have if there was no, I guess, war between them. But then again, I'm sure they probably would have loved the peace. I mean, I guess the warlords and stuff like that, the higher up people probably love probably making a lot of money. I guess it's the regular people probably didn't like care, probably, not, probably didn't care for it too much because it probably messed up their business having this war going on and they were probably get thrown into it. So I don't know. Perhaps would hit the fan, right? And without access to the Persian Gulf, however, Direct Ottoman intervention would be minimal at first. <laughs> yeah. When you walk in the door oh with the new triple dying. bacon pizza from Papa okay. John's, oh, that smell of bacony right. goodness has everyone showing up. And I mean everyone. Good. All right, there you go. Sorry. Some efforts were made to shore up the Ottoman Red Obviously, they're going to. You know, and I was trying to scroll down, but the video has to do that for me. Obviously, they have to get, you know, into the Indian Ocean. So, obviously, they're going to have to, yeah, make sure this 
the Red Sea is all fine and dandy and they're in control, is right? Sea fleet prior to the capture of Basra. In 1525, Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha reorganized the old Mamluk fleet, with Selman Reis again serving as admiral after a short imprisonment, possibly for his earlier defection to the Mamluks. Having already beaten the Portuguese fleet once off Jeddah in 1517, arranging his galleys in a tight formation under the cover of the shore batteries so as to force the ocean-going Portuguese ships to either retreat or fight a Mediterranean-style battle of boarders and fire ships, Selman managed to do what both the Mamluks and the Portuguese had failed to do and secured effective control of Yemen by 1527. This marked the first serious Ottoman challenge to Portuguese dominance in the Indian Ocean, and Selman's victories encouraged the numerous Muslim rulers in western India to turn to the Ottoman Empire for protection as their suzerain. In the following years, Ottoman soldiers and military experts would be sent to the courts of Gujarat and Calicut, simultaneously strengthening the defences of crucial port cities, increasing the influence of the Ottoman Sultan abroad, and giving credibility to his recently adopted title of Caliph. One of these consulting Ottoman generals would soon be called on to do battle with the Portuguese on the site of the Portuguese triumph of 1509, Diu. Together with Surat on the opposite side of the Gulf of Kambet, Diu was among the most important trading hubs of Western India, and would represent a major prize for the Portuguese. It was thus in Diu that the Ottoman-Portuguese wars would start in earnest, with a large Portuguese fleet of over 400 ships, carrying close to 6,000 soldiers, attacking the city's Gujarati and Ottoman garrison in 1531. Led by Alfonso's successor as governor of Portuguese India, Admiral Nuno de Cunha, this new fleet was significantly stronger than the one that had been victorious against the Mamluks in 1509. And unlike the first fleet, this one carried a fearsome mixed army of Portuguese soldiers and conscripted auxiliaries from the Malabar coast, which had shown its effectiveness in numerous engagements already. However, despite boasting complete naval superiority over the mere 18 Ottoman ships arrayed against them, de Cunha had met his match in Mustafa Bayram. The unparalleled Ottoman artillery crews dealt severe damage to the besiegers, while the narrow waterways separating Diu Island from the mainland frustrated Portuguese efforts to bring the firepower of their large fleet to bear. Now they just came in and just like hammered them home. I mean, yeah, these guys, bam, 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 like just have better guns and just like, and yeah, your numbers ain't gonna work when, uh, you can't use them all. It's not like you can widen and swallow them whole, right? And flank them. I mean, you got this small opening here. Yeah, your big ships, I mean, all your, the numbers doesn't help there. I guess you'd be better off to kind of wait for them to kind of come out here and then kind of surround them. I don't know. Frustrated Portuguese efforts to bring the firepower of their large fleet to bear. This first siege of Diu demonstrated the limitations of both empires. While de Cunha could not overcome the combination of Gujarati numbers and Ottoman gunnery to capture the city, neither could Mustafa Bayram destroy de Cunha's fleet to end the threat it posed. The fortress remained Gujarati, but the sea remained Portuguese, with de Cunha plundering Surat and other poorly defended Gujarati ports after withdrawing in defeat from Diu. The Ottoman-Portuguese wars would not begin in earnest until seven years later, though. In a bizarre twist, the roles of the two empires would be almost completely reversed in the Second Siege. Increasing military pressure from the Mughal Empire, combined with the inability of the Ottomans to protect their maritime interests, drove Sultan Bahadur to sign the Treaty of Bassein in 1534 and cede numerous islands and territories, including Bombay and Diu, despite the successful defense of the city three years prior. In the same year, Suleiman took Baghdad from the Safavids and gained the nominal fealty of Basra, opening a new avenue to the Indian Ocean. With his war in Persia ending and affairs in Europe quiet for the time being, Suleiman finally turned to confront the Portuguese head-on, building shipyards in the Suez and Yemen and greatly expanding his Red Sea fleet. 
The drowning of Sultan Bahadur during negotiations aboard a Portuguese vessel in 1537 provided the spark of war, and in 1538, the Ottoman fleet under the command of Hadim Suleiman Pasha attacked Diu Fort, laying siege to the same city they had helped defend seven years prior. Although the Ottoman fleet numbered only 80 ships, compared to the 400 ships the Portuguese had fielded in 1531, they were of heavier build than the light galleys comprising most of the Portuguese fleet, and it carried a similar force of soldiers. Though a naval engagement still would have favoured the Portuguese. They have big, bigger, stronger ships, basically, you know, and obviously you have a great big ship and you know the other person has you outnumbered. One of your ships probably, you know, can count for like, like two or three of their ships, I guess, depending on the size and the firepower, right? So, I mean, yeah, Portuguese still got the numbers, but it's not as big of an advantage as you might think. The Ottoman Armada had caught the Portuguese largely by surprise and arrived unopposed on September 4th after capturing and plundering Aden en route. De Cunha and other Portuguese admirals had expected the Ottoman fleet to make for Muscat or Hormuz, but once again it was here, due. Upon landing, the 6,000 Turkish soldiers aboard the royal galleys of the Armada disembarked to join a larger force of 16,000 Gujarati soldiers under the command of Kajar Safar, which had been besieging the fortress for the past two months, though with little success due to a lack of ships and cannon. Also present was the Ottoman captain, Hoja Safaj, who maintained a small Turkish force in Gujarat after Mustafa Bayram's departure to preserve the waning influence of the Ottoman Sultan over their Indian ally. With only 3,000 Portuguese in the fort, of which only 600 were soldiers under Antonio de Silveira's command, the vastly superior Ottoman and Gujarati numbers appeared insurmountable, especially when backed by Ottoman siege gunnery. Yeah. But the Portuguese still held a number of advantages. Firstly, the fort they were defending was newly built along European lines, greatly superior to the outdated medieval fortifications it had replaced. A small bastion in the channel to the north, placed halfway between the fort and a redoubt on the mainland, allowed chains to be drawn across the Diu channel to cut off the Ottoman galleys. Secondly, the alliance between Suleiman and Mahmud Shah III of Gujarat was weaker than it might seem. Despite the Portuguese having abandoned the city of Diu without battle upon the arrival of the Gujarati army, falling back into the fort to make their stand, a force of Ottoman janissaries ransacked it shortly after disembarking. The senseless damage enraged many Gujarati nobles, and with Mahmud Shah's succession already disputed, he risked losing his throne if too much of the nobility turned against his Ottoman patrons. This diplomatic breakdown would hamper the Ottomans in the coming siege, with the Gujaratis reluctant to supply the hungry Ottoman force. And lastly, the Ottomans were not willing to risk their fleet in open battle so far from their home shores, putting them under pressure to capture the fort quickly before Portuguese reinforcements from Goa could arrive. A dire situation for the Ottomans. They kind of have to yeah, have a quick fight here, but like, without their, they're going to have to like sacrifice or not sacrifice, but they're going to have to get some help from their navy, man. Despite these various disadvantages, the Ottomans made rapid progress building siege works about the surrounded fort, and by September 28th, a punishing bombardment was underway. But the first hasty attempts to storm the walls were repulsed with significant losses. As the volleys continued over the coming month, various attempts would be made to weaken the defences. First, Kaja Safa targeted the Portuguese strongpoint on the north bank of the Diu Channel, assaulting it with Gujarati forces backed up by Ottoman guns. The small fort's 40 Portuguese defenders held firm, however, and Kajar's attempt to smoke the defenders out with fire ships was foiled when a Portuguese nighttime attack lit the craft prematurely. This initial Portuguese victory would be short-lived. On October 1st, 
the Redoubt's commander, Francisco Pacheco, was forced to surrender after narrowly beating back a second assault by Hardin's Janissaries. Despite an agreement between Suleiman Pasha and Pacheco to grant safe passage to the fort, the remaining defenders were imprisoned on the Pasha's galley. The redoubt had been silenced, though this was a small victory. So part of the piece, you know, for them putting the wave and the white flag, I guess, or giving up here is like, okay, we get to go in peace pretty much, right? And it's just said they imprisoned them. Damn. I bet you that probably happened you know, more time, a lot of times, you know, or like, you know, they make a treaty and as soon as they get control of the fort, you know, the ones who take control probably back out on that treaty a lot. But I guess it can't be too much because if you back out a lot, then you kind of get the reputation of that and then people aren't going to trust you. Victory. And all the Ottomans had to show for most of a month of effort. In an attempt to avoid the losses a continued siege would entail, Suleiman Pasha had the captured de Pacheco write a letter to de Silveya, detailing the good treatment he had received on the Pasha's galley and the overwhelming power of the Ottoman army in an attempt to secure de Silveya's surrender. This would prove unsuccessful, however, with de Silveya viewing Pacheco's imprisonment as an act of treachery by Suleiman. Well, yeah, I'm going to say, like, come on, he's not going to fall for that. I mean, he's, like, in prison, so he's basically going to do whatever the Ottomans tell him to do, or else he's going to die. So, I mean, that would have been totally different if the base over here was, it hasn't been taken yet, and then he sent that note over. But he's in prison, so obviously he's going to do what he's told to do. He's being, probably getting tortured, maybe. I don't know. With the negotiations a failure, the Ottomans returned to the siege, with the last of their artillery unloaded and in place by October 5th. But even with the full force of their army brought to bear, attempts to assault the fortress through the partially collapsed bulwarks on October 12th and 13th failed, and the efforts of Ottoman sappers to breach the walls with gunpowder charges were hampered by barricades erected within the walls by Portuguese non-combatants. The next target of the besiegers would be the sea fort in the Diu Channel. I know that they, they said it was a, you know, definitely a, it's a better fort than the medieval forts kind of thing. It's more, it's, you know, more modern, more Europe, European. I'm definitely curious. Uh, I wish there was like, a, they explain like a one minute video just to explain, I guess, the difference. Uh, you know, I did a video on castles and stuff like that, but like, I guess the walls are just shaped different, like more better, better materials. I'm guessing that would stop uh, a cannonball a lot better, kind of thing. And then maybe just I guess the angles and stuff probably better, where they get a ricochet off, kind of thing. I don't know, but I'd be kind of curious to see like, what the, the big difference is, you know, between the, the two, like the medieval and the more modern one here. With Ottoman galleys attempting to storm it on October 27th and 28th. But without any surrounding landmass to disembark besiegers on, attackers would be forced to scale the sea fort's walls directly from their galleys, a difficult task in the face of the cannon fire and firebombs of the well-stocked Portuguese garrison. Right. Eighteen galleys in total would be committed between the two attacks, but despite significant casualties, the defenders of the sea fort successfully weathered the attacks and forced the battered galleys into retreat. After the failure to capture the sea fort, the cracks were beginning to show in the Allied siege effort. The simmering dispute between the Ottomans and the Gujarati nobility left Suleiman Pasha's army in a precarious position for supplies, and despite the strength of the Ottoman fleet, they were unable to prevent swift Portuguese foists from making landings to resupply and reinforce the defenders. Faced with the possibility of being cut off by the Portuguese fleet in Goa, Suleiman Pasha could not risk prolonging the fruitless siege. On October 30th, the Ottoman forces began withdrawing back to their ships. De Silveya knew better than to drop his guard while still surrounded, however. His vigilance would pay off when the Ottoman retreat proved to be a last ruse by Suleiman Pasha, who launched a massive final attack on the morning of the 31st. The majority of the Ottoman Gujarati army, as many as 14,000, attacked under a heavy artillery barrage. 
The 600 soldiers that had held the fort at the beginning of the siege had since dwindled to 100 or fewer, with more of the soldiers now imprisoned on Ottoman galleys than remaining to defend the fort. But with the situation as dire as it had become, much of the fort's civilian population took up arms in its defence as well, wow. with some sources suggesting a group of female soldiers saw active duty in the frenzied battle. Damage to the fortress bulwarks was severe, and at several points along the walls, Gujarati or Ottoman soldiers succeeded in winning their way onto the ramparts to raise their banners above the beleaguered fort. But just as in the initial assaults, the time constraints the besiegers faced worked against them. In their haste to crush the remaining opposition, the troops attacking the walls were exposed to significant friendly Ooh. fire from the ongoing cannon volleys. Though the fighting on October 31st would stretch the defenders to the breaking point, the attackers were again repulsed, and though similar attacks on the following days would have inevitably ended in an Ottoman victory, no more would be forthcoming. A relief force of 24 Portuguese galleys was mistaken for the vanguard of the governor's powerful Goa fleet, while a small sortie by the remaining defenders created the impression that the fort was still garrisoned to withstand another attack. On November 6th, the Ottoman fleet hurriedly embarked for Yemen, while Qajar Safar torched his camp and withdrew to the mainland. A mere 40 soldiers remained fit for battle inside the fort when the relief fleet arrived, yet they had held off the largest Ottoman expedition ever dispatched to India, with the Turkish Armada returning to Yemen 1,200 men lighter. Wow. The failure to capture Diu was a major loss for the Ottomans, weakening their influence in India and straining their critical alliance with the Gujarat Sultanate. Spice would continue to work its way around the Cape of Good Hope, with even the merchants of Venice at times forced to purchase from their Portuguese rivals. But Suleiman's efforts in the Indian Ocean had not been for naught. The construction of shipyards in Basra and Aden had greatly strengthened the Ottoman position compared to the feeble Mamluks. While Ibrahim Pasha and Selman Reis's improved fleet had forced the Portuguese to end their long Red Sea blockade. Therefore, though the Ottomans had failed to drive the Portuguese from the Indian Ocean, they did succeed in reinvigorating the Egyptian spice trade, with Arab and Indian merchants again braving the risk of Portuguese piracy to sell their wares in Alexandria. The old and new trade routes would uneasily coexist over the next decades as the rival empires competed for dominance. Next time on the Ottoman-Portuguese Wars, we cross the Indian Ocean to the African theater, where the mighty nations of Ethiopia and Adel battle for dominance under the watchful eyes of their imperial backers. So make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. All right, I'd be looking forward to that next time. But wow, man, they were like, what was it, 40 people they said they had left? And they had all that help from, I guess, the community in there, you know, all the civilians and the women even joined in, they said, might have. Wow. And I feel a lot, I guess, when it comes to battles and stuff, trying to show how strong you are is huge. Any show of weakness, and they're, they're probably going to come back, maybe, and uh, to actually take it. Like, like I said, one more siege and it was probably done like the whole thing was going to be over uh but they didn't i mean because they had their own issues of their own the ottomans did obviously but wow they held on i thought for sure that last time once they got past that first all was done like everyone in that city's getting slaughtered but i guess it's not all for nothing i mean they got their trade back you know and uh they showed some dominance you know as the with their new shipyards and stuff like that and but this is just the beginning i guess and now we're gonna go to africa which is gonna be super interesting uh you know because we haven't really with ethiopia or whatever over there sorry uh you know it'd be kind of interesting how they, they're they kind of involved in all this but anyways guys please hit that like and subscribe button below let me know your thoughts below like always and yeah this is another super interesting cool battle and yeah, that, that one little island there, that's just off the base, you know, the island fort. Yeah, like, if there's no beach and you're just trying to, I guess, get on there and you have to scale the wall, man, that, 
I mean, it almost feel like it's like hopeless. I mean, because guys are just shooting down. They have enough people in there just to shoot down on you and take you. Uh, man, that'd be scary as hell trying to take that thing. But anyways, yeah, hit the like and subscribe. Uh, catch you guys in future videos. You guys are awesome. Peace. I am out of here. Woohoo.